This is a husband and wife, dual income together. Total expenses here is uh, 7,427 seven cents. Total debt is 3,887,000. Mm -hmm. Hey, I, I think I'm doing something wrong. And I'm like, yeah, like we need to address <laughs> behavior first, right? If we don't change the behavior, we're just literally rearranging the furniture on the Titanic. They're trying to use these fully optimized tool, yeah. but they have no idea what they're looking at. Some of them aren't wrong to say, I don't even want to go down this because we're flirting with fire. Velocity banking is great to give us that head start, but I think yeah. there comes a time where we should shut it off. Like it, it just, yeah. we, we shouldn't use it. Because I just want to just address the elephant in the room. But we all know people that are delusional. Yes. We know people that are optimistic when they shouldn't be. All right, Denzel, the people have spoken. They want part two, they want numbers, they want case studies. They want the whiteboard. And so you're back on the show. Welcome back. And we're going to be rolling up our sleeves. My sleeves are already up, by the way. You might need to roll yours up. <laughs> and uh, we're getting yeah. into the numbers. And just, just in full transparency, guys, I've not seen this. This is the first time I'm going through this. And the beautiful thing about uh, my relationship with, with Denzel is I can challenge him and ask him anything. And so you are going to see us in real time have a conversation with real numbers. And, and it really comes down to this concept of velocity banking, this concept of infinite banking, what is better, what is worth. We, we had a episode where we did before where we talked about philosophies that will be linked down below or it might pop up on the screen somewhere. Um, if you have not seen that video, I would highly encourage you to watch that. It's gonna give you extra context, but this one is gonna be for the nerds who want to see the numbers. And uh, there's a lot of people on YouTube that likes to see the numbers. So Denzel, anything you wanna say before you freak people out and share your whiteboard and uh, we jump into the numbers? Yeah, so for, for those that are brand new to me and you're like, whoa once you go to see the whiteboard it might be a little a little too much for for some that are brand new but for my seasoned listeners those that are are well versed this is either going to be a refresher an eye opener might be able to pick up a gem or two or it's just going to be something another video for you to sharpen your skills when you're running your own numbers and you're able to really step into my mind for the next 30 45 minutes here and also, the video that Caleb and I did where we were talking philosophies, one thing that's really cool is being able to watch it yourself and to see how you were, where your mindset was, how your thinking was, and how it either changes, evolves, slight tweaks. So I, I know for me, my philosophies and ideas have, have shifted, not in, dramatically, but they have improved. And I've been able to go back and say, oh yeah, I like what Caleb said here. Okay, what Caleb said here didn't it didn't hit me then, but now two three years later, it's starting to hit more a little more differently now that I'm actually working with more and more clients, and I'm able to see them go through the seasons of you know velocity banking to infinite banking or velocity and infinite both or none at all. So it's really really cool. Just want to you know lay that all out. And for today's discussion, we're going to be looking at a real case study. I have a real case study for you, and this is. A really cool one because I get to show you guys what has already happened. It's cool. So there's no assuming here. Like majority of what's what I'm sharing with you on the board has already happened. And then I'll share with you the the assumption part. And I've even dated it so that there's no confusion, right? Cool. Let's so, uh, before you share your screen, okay. what are we let's set the stage. What are what are we going to be reviewing? Because again, you have a lot of numbers, you have wonderful handwriting but there's still a lot of numbers. So what are we gonna be looking at before you share your screen? So we're gonna be looking at a husband and wife in their, in their 50s. Primary goal is to eliminate debt. And based on our conversation on, you know, looking at velocity banking, good, bad, and ugly, here's an example where velocity banking, I think really makes a lot of sense for this particular couple here. Um, what they did, the, the steps prior to even getting velocity banking going, and then being able to show you what they literally did in the last 60 days or so um, in, in 2024. So it's really, really cool. Uh, and then I definitely want you to be able to pick at it and say, oh, what if we could have did this? Cool. Something like that. So that would be fun. Cool. And I just want to give you a shout out. If you enjoy Denzel and have not subscribed to his channel, I'm sure most people already have because your channel is way bigger than mine. Um, <laughs> go, go. We'll have a link down below. Subscribe. And then when you comment, it really helps get this video out to more people. So comment your biggest takeaway or your biggest question 
Uh, this won't be the last video that Denzel and I do. And again, if you share if you share this video with others, it literally tells YouTube that this was a valuable video. And so with that, let's roll up our sleeves, man, and let's get into this. Let's do it. My favorite part, diving right into the numbers. So like I always do in all my videos, I inform my clients and audience that's very, 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 very important that you know your numbers down to the T, uh, down to the penny, right? Know exactly what's coming in, what's coming out. So I usually start with the four major numbers. This is a husband and wife dual income together is 8,118. That's net after taxes, total expenses here. This includes saving, giving, tithing, investing, debt payments, living, everything is uh, 7,427 seven cents. Total debt is 3,887,000. And we have a net cash flow of about 690 bucks. And prior to them becoming a client with me, they were, I, I want to say they were watching a little bit of you, a couple of other IBC channels, myself, a couple of velocity channels are all over the place. And then they find it kind of narrowed in just to say, okay, we're gonna go with Denzel, right? Cool. So that's kind of like how it happened. Yeah. And they were in the process of finding a home equity line of credit so that they can practice this, this, this concept. They kind of were already, you know, doing it. And in the middle here is a bunch of credit card debt and a mm. car loan. And you see all these interest rates, right? The, the bulk of their debt is a mortgage, which I put right here, right? Mortgage okay. payments, 1499 interest rate, 2.6%. They owe 235. The value of it is 396. So they had nice. plenty of, plenty of equity to go get a HELOC. Now, if we're, if we're just looking at, all right, this person's goal, they want to be debt free. They want to practice. They want to do IBC. They want to do real estate and they want to do ministry, all right? These people are in the church, Christians. Right. Really, really wholesome people. Uh, they've got a 401k. They got some cash on hand two term life insurance policies. That's it. It's all they have. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, they're, they're not entrepreneurs, but do desire to get into real estate. That that's where they think they can. Really why, why real life. estate? Like, I know that's a cliche word, but it's just like, just, just because that's so, what Robert Kiyosaki said, or is they, they, cause it's like, they want to eliminate that. And then they see real estate as like their, door to financial freedom they do see real estate as their door to financial freedom they've had some dealings in the real estate space um and they've actually had some failure so one of the things i often ask my clients is hey how did we get here in the first place right how did we actually get into all this debt like are we yeah. just simply bad stewards of money do we overspend do we you know live a lifestyle that doesn't match our income in this case, it was a real estate deal gone bad, right? And that it ended up, they ended up using a lot of credit cards to finance the errors that were made. Um, mm -hmm. And so now we're able to say, all right, they don't really have a spending problem. They don't, they don't have a, a, a bad, you know, management problem. They're pretty good with their money overall. They just had this, you know, unfortunate event happen. And they did not know how to borrow effectively. So they used yeah. what they had, all these high interest yeah. credit cards yeah. and boom, forces them to go on YouTube, YouTube university, boom, they find Denzel. That's kind of <laughs> yeah. like how, how Which is it, good for them. Good for good them. For so them. let's go back. Let's go back because they're, we're seeing 20, we're pretty much seeing 30%, you know, balances. Now the good news is some of these are small, but yeah, that's pretty, that that's a reverse snowball that you don't want. It is. And on top of this, right, the, the other two debts, they have another car loan for 45 grand, 8.25%, and a SoFi loan, 55K, 15%. So hmm. it's like the way they've been borrowing has been very inefficient. inefficient. And yep. so when they came across Velocity Banking, they saw a way of being able to leverage, borrow way more efficiently, less, less you know, cost on the back end. So from that perspective, that was a plus for them. And yep. they also were looking at like, oh, what if I went with like national debt relief or something, or one of these companies where I can just consolidate a bunch of debt. If you were to compare those options compared to Velocity Banking, I think like nine times out of 10, Velocity Banking always outperforms a national debt relief or those debt consolidation companies where they're like tank your credit, 
um, you know, there's no guarantee they'll help you or be able to settle certain yep. debts. Um, so there's, you know, I'd say and, arguably more risk than um, doing yeah, something like that. And just, and just for the listener who may not know what velocity banking is, watch our other episode. But velocity banking is essentially doing a first lien HELOC on a home home where you are able to, it's essentially interest only. So you're able to take out additional money of quote unquote equity. And you would say in this scenario, they paid off credit cards and then they took what they were paying to the credit cards and rolled it back into the home. I, I'm, not, I'm assuming, I'm not sure if that's, but like that's the concept of velocity banking. It's, it's first lien HELOC on your home. Right. First lien HELOC is typically like the the, the, the go-to, the most popular thing in this scenario, we're dealing with a second position, home okay. equity line of credit. And the, the second part of the concept is being able to park all of your income into one location and have all of those dollars working for you, reducing the interest cost that you pay on that revolving line. So in this cool. scenario, we have a second position, home equity line of credit for 75K with an intro rate at 5.99%, no, mm. closing, no closing costs. Afterwards, it jumps to 8.5%, assuming that the feds don't reduce rates in the next six months, which they, right. might, they might do. So I'm just going to assume that it'll be 8.5%. On top of that, they have a 0% credit card for 15 months with a credit limit of 11400 Okay, Got it. So now the actual. And that was after meeting you. That was after meeting you and you helping correct. them with that. Okay. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. So now, cool. now we're going to, I'm going to show you what happened. But prior to, I'm just going to also share with the audience here, especially new listeners, like how we go about using debt more effectively. I have yeah. two rules that have not failed me or any of my clients so far. And what's, what's really unique is when these rules get abused, we can see what those end results are. I have so many stories of these rules getting abused, some having success, but most of the time not having success. Yeah. And then what's also unique is these, these two rules I have usually flow right with the situation that's, that's at hand. So those yeah. two rules are, as it relates to leveraging, I take the person's cash flow per month times it by 12. I take the credit limit of the tool that we're using, the HELOC 75K, times it by 66% or two thirds, right? So it might be 67 or 66, whichever, you know, is basically two thirds. And I basically tell the client, this is my personal preference and opinion. I don't like to leverage more than two thirds of my line. And I don't like to put more than 12 months of cash flow, uh, quote unquote, at risk, future cash flow. That's essentially what we're doing is we're borrowing from future cash flow months, pushing yep. it all up to right now in the HELOC, and then trying to consolidate, move some debts around, recover cash flow much faster. So that's essentially what- Are you, in, in another way of saying that, you, you don't want them to take, if can you go back to the board, you wouldn't yeah. want them to take the 75,000 and leverage every dollar. So you're saying, is that, is that, right. is that, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm, but, but you could also say if you're already, if you have credit cards at 29%, you potentially could justify taking $74,999 and knock that out. But, but oh you're, God. you're not wrong. Like your whole deal is like, it's a good idea to not leverage period because you never know where that could go. But there's a difference between a 6% loan and a 29% loan. Exactly. And, and even when the rate is so enticing, um, we, we often have that mentality of, let me just take this whole amount. And I think that comes from what we typically do when we go to a bank and get a big lump sum loan. We're getting a lump sum amount of money and we're consolidating a bunch of debt, however much debt we can pay off and stick over here. So that mentality isn't the same when it comes to velocity banking. We're not trying to do that. And in, in fact, we can get better results when we do it in bytes or what I call chunk sizes, right? Okay. So developing our chunk range is looking at cash flow times 12, credit limit times two thirds. You'll get anywhere between 8,291.16 as high as 49,500. So I tell the client, this is your range. This is healthy, safe. 
And now let's look at what you have, right? So we were looking at all the debt, right? All the debt is on here. It's just in three different places. We got these two big debts over here. I said, these are too big to even tackle just yep. yet. And it just doesn't make sense to move 2.6 to this 5.99 that could jump to eight and a half. So yep. you would be you would be taking this fixed debt and putting it into a variable location. Yep. Um, and it's going to be harder for you to control that with your income and cash flow as of right yep. now. So I said, okay, now that you understand that, put that to the side. These debts are too big because you have these debts over here in your yep. way. So we looked at everything. Uh, we looked at cash flow index to help us pick these debts. And that's kind of like what we came to. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven credit cards, all at interest rates much higher than 5.99. Yeah, it's understatement of the day. <laughs> yeah. And then we have this car loan from a, from a cash flow perspective um, and arguably interest savings, right? Because you're like, whoa, 5.36 versus 5.99, Denzel. This is less than that. Why would you move this over here? And my reasoning there is a there's a there's more cash flow to be recovered here immediately. Uh, yep. B the five point nine nine ends up becoming a must a much lesser net cost from so, a cash flow perspective. Yeah, um, and and when we're when you add up all this cash flow savings plus their existing cash flow and the income that would be flowing in and out of the HELOC, we're, we're able to save yeah. so much money. Uh, just, a lot just, of damage. Let's, let's just talk about that for a second. So from a cash flow perspective, you're absolutely right. From a cash flow perspective, uh, yeah, they're, they're, you, you're paying less because it's interest only. Even at, I bet you even at, you know, the 9 per, or 8.5%, cash flow perspective, you still might be less out of pocket. From a pure mathematic interest rates though you would be if you're looking at which which one is better or worse just from an interest rate perspective obviously you are paying maybe more interest but for us we're not necessarily like this is the baseline we're looking for cash flow and then looking for uh, opportunities ultimately that create more cash flow so i'm totally good with yeah. with your way of reasoning and but but you would agree that if you had to choose like the credit cards would be way greater to knock out than a than a 3.5 like a 5.3 it's like a good problem if you're comparing should i do this or that getting those credit cards out are a game changer absolutely yep so add up all these numbers together you're gonna get forty two thousand five twelve twenty one, and look at that right in Boom. my range right in my range cycle so it usually always works out just right where it needs to be the cash flow gain would be one thousand four seventy five sixty one. Add it all together, we're looking at 2166.54. That would be parked in the HELOC. And then of that number, interest would, would come out month to month. Yep. Right. And I'm going to display that over here. In addition, this 0% credit card is 0% uh, on purchases for the next 15 months. So what we did was we looked at their expenses over here, their living expenses, and said, okay, what are some bills that we could pay up for the whole year? And we would get a temporary cash flow gain, and the bill is gone for the next 12 months. And then what you would do is typically, if we're able to remove, say, 500 bucks worth of bills for the next 12 months, it's temporary cash flow gain, so not to get confused, temporary, the monthly payment back to the card is probably going to be no more than $50 on mm. on what we would um what the credit card company would require us to pay because it's at zero percent and usually they'll charge one percent of the balance of what you owe right so mm -hmm. in this case they owe six thousand five oh four uh as of right now another rule i have i use the same rule i say yeah even though it's zero percent i'm not gonna use the whole 11.4. You totally could, but for me personally, I'd rather not. So my max is 7,500 bucks. So if you do, you know, 11.4 times two thirds, you should get somewhere around $7,500. Mm -hmm. so I said, look, once you get to 75, stop. 
and you're just going to pay a monthly minimum payment. It's probably going to be around this number, 50 bucks, might be 75, you know, it, it, it varies. Sometimes it's like as low as like $30, like super, yep. super cheap. Um, so if you did 1%, it would be 75 bucks. Well, the amount of cash flow we just recovered is more than the payment back to the card. Where does that cash flow sit? Right in the line. So now maybe we're at $2,500. Yeah. And so we're able to constantly, you know, keep bringing down this net uh, cost per month. And so what I did. Because be- all the other payments are going towards the HELOC. And when you put that in, you're getting more liquidity to be able to use. Correct. Correct. And I, the game plan would be before that 15 months is over, you would have plenty of equity, equity that we could use uh-huh. or, to pay off that credit card. Yep. Or they could get another credit card at 0% and do it all over again with the next bills. But just, just so that people know, that bill had to get paid no matter what. So right. all they did was use credit to pay it first, and then their expense, their their bill that was going to be used for bills, that the money is sitting in the line. So the best thing they can do is when that expires, they pull from the line, pay back the card, done. Yep. Right. But by then, the balance would have gone down so much more. Yep. Right. Makes over sense. that period of time. So that's that's like gravy, what I call in in velocity banking, the the main tool is your HELOC and your and your second tool can be a credit card or a multitude of credit cards as it gets more and more complex. But for newbies, this is a new person practicing, new household practicing the concept. We're going to stick to one tool, one card. Once we get it to a certain dollar amount, we're going to stop. They're going to use a second credit card to continue running bills on a month-to-month basis for the sole purpose of getting cashback rewards. Yep. And that means that they're also parking a percentage of this $7,400 is, is staying parked in a credit card for roughly 20, 25 days at zero yep. interest. And again, it, it just starts compounding more and more. They're going to end up paying less than 1% to 2% in net cost for the first six months. Uh, and even when it jumps to 8.5%, it'll probably still net out around 3 4 Uh yep. so, so now hey. – can we can we stop there? Just pause there because I just want to just address the elephant in the room. The I think critics could say that we're just by being cute here, we're just prolonging the heart of the issue of how they got in the same. Like we're almost enabling them to continue to spend above their means. But my I know you, and you, and there's also coaching that's going along with this to say, listen, yeah, we can play we can play gymnastics, but if if we don't change the behavior, we're just literally rearranging the furniture on the Titanic. Yes. And so so obviously, like you mentioned, real estate made some mistakes. So that there's obviously this stuff is so powerful if you also go into behavior change and coaching mode and say, How do we do this and change the behavior? Powerful. Mm-hmm. We, obviously there's gonna be people that watch this and they're on this tra- treadmill of like zero percent cards zero percent cards zero percent cards but they're getting worse and worse and that the zero percent hit is only is giving them like it's numbing them to go and get into worst deal and so i just want to like i just want to acknowledge like the dave ramsey's of the world some of them aren't wrong to say i don't even want to go down this because we're flirting with fire yeah and also also efficiency is remove any friction to get to where you want to go what we're going, you're going to see like, this is a ninja way to efficiently bring this thing down. And then if you can change your behavior and not be a consumer, not consume more than you can create, but start creating more than you consume and use these tools to not just get deck free, but do what you said, become financially free. So you can do more ministry, like powerful. So I just want to, again, acknowledge that. Cause it's just like, um, you know, I, you know, obviously that could be obvious, but I think it's important that we address that because, um, like anything, people people can use cool hacks and not change their behavior. And as a result, it's ena- enabling a worse outcome. Yes, it is so interesting. Now that I've been doing this, now that I have some years in, about five, almost six years now working with folks, um, I'm better at spotting the person that's yep. trying to, to 
become a samurai overnight, right? Yeah. They're, they're, they're trying to use these, these really efficient, fully optimized tool, yeah. but they have no idea what they're looking at. You know, it's yeah. like me buying these DSLR cameras in my first year of creating yeah. content. I would have no idea how to use these things. I probably would break them. Yeah. So for the person watching that's new, doesn't know me, and you've never had a financial coach before, and you think you can watch three to four videos, and you're like, I got it, right? I'm about to go run. There's some people out there, I won't lie, <laughs> that are watching that are good. Those are your engineers. <laughs> those are your 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 math whiz. They they actually went to college for math, and they're just off to the races. They're, they're an architect. They're in construction. They get it. Cool. Majority of people, they watch yep. three to five videos. They take my stuff. They go run with it. And then they become my client and they're yeah. like, Hey, I, I think I'm doing something wrong. And I'm like, yeah, like we need to address <laughs> behavior first. Right. Exactly. Like, and you could be a math whiz and still your behavior by, by the way, um, if you want to work with Denzel, if you want to be like, Hey, I resonate with this. I want to see if this is, this should be a good fit for me. We'll have a link down below Denzel that goes to I you. That. Um, and that would be, yeah. that'd be awesome. It's one of the, one of the fun things in the better wealth network, connecting incredible people. And, uh, so let's, let's continue, but I just, yeah, appreciate okay. that, that pot, that tactical pause. Yeah, that was good. Now let me show you where this client is today on the right hand side of the board here. It is, it's March 27th, right? It was yesterday. We're recording on March 28th today, but yesterday I spoke to them. And they shared that this is where their balance is on their HELOCs at $37,350 and 61 cents. If you do the math daily, they're paying $6 and 12 cents for however long we owe 37 grand. Um, and you'll see that, okay, they were at 42. They did the chunk. They got the cash flow. They were doing it. And then they ran a bunch of bills over the last 30, 45 days or so. And here we are now here's where the balance is so it's like things are kind of matching up real well so all this is gone right that's a win in and of itself all that all we Huge did win. was debt consolidation we did it for less cost no origination fees we're not locked in to any company we didn't have to risk our credit destroy our credit so from that that's a win now where velocity actually starts is where i'm going to illustrate the, the income actually going into the line, what that looks like, and then expenses coming out. Obviously our expenses are reduced by the amount that we're no longer paying uh, to these different institutions. So all I'm doing in a very conservative way is illustrating what they should pay in interest month to month for the uh, six month promo, right? So from March all the way to mm -hmm. August, right? September is when it should, cancel. I think I have my math right. So income going in, the balance would go down to 29,232.61 times 5.99 divide by 365, your daily costs $4.79. Take expenses out. Balance should end at the end of April. So I'm, even though we're in March, I'm showing what this looks like for the next month for April. Mm -hmm. So it should be $35,184.07, $5.77 per day for however long we owe that number. Now, what actually happens is they get paid bi-weekly times two. So we have four checks in a month that this couple is receiving. So actually what's happening is they're going to owe 37 and then they might owe 35 and then 32 and then 31 and then it goes up to 33. And so it's going to go gradually up and down, up and down, then it should level out around this number. So this is an overestimation on what they'll pay on in interest. So if you take these three numbers, add them up, divide by three, and then times it by 30 days, you should get $166.87. That is a lot less than 5.99. And so people need to see that like, Oh shoot, on a on a month to month on 37 grand initially starting out, I only paid $166 in interest. That's insane. Um, and so when you compound that over a few months, then we're able to see like what the net uh, interest rate ends up looking like, you know, for an entire year.
but I can assure you it's going to be far less than 5.99, even when it jumps up to 8.5. So I, what I did was I added the interest and then final number, 35, 350, 94. And to be even more conservative, I, I did another month of income in, expenses out, and then what I usually do to- And you're also including the cash flow that was going to the credit cards, correct? Going right. back into the policy? Yeah, so the, the, the okay. no, I'm sorry. This, this did not get included in this example to be even more conservative. So, okay. and I love- But you did, now eliminating the credit cards though, are you including, like if you eliminate those credit card minimum payments- they're already paying that to begin with. Are you including that going to the HELOC or did you not include that? So I included this, right? Okay, perfect. The, the, the cash flow gain. Like okay, that's, cool. that's okay, what cool. it shows. But what I didn't include was the amount of bills that they threw on this 0% card and the Got temporary it. cash flow gain from that. I didn't include yeah. that. I appreciate that though. It's like yeah. you're being... You're being conservative, knowing that life happens, and on the so, flip side, so playing correct. devil's advocate. And I have, and I have something to share. I have something yeah. to share, especially with this okay. particular case, because okay. we were able to uncover something, and I was like, "Oh, this is why I always like underplay velocity banking. I make it look worse than what it, you know, should yeah. do." And from a visual perspective, like I'm making these case study videos, recording them, and I'm sending them to my clients so that they can see it for themselves. Now right. they have a visual and they're like, okay, th this is what Denzel says the number should be. And then six months later, they're like, Hey, it's, it's, it's less than, than, than what we said. And I'm like, you know, I'm boosting them up. Right. Yeah. Little did they know I was yeah, kind that's great. No, and that's also purpose. the reason why you should be conservative with the numbers. Yes. Even like not let someone borrow dollar for dollar, mainly because life happens. Mm -hmm. And so let like, continue to go. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm an active <laughs> listener. So, yes. Right. So if you, you know, look here by August, the balance is all the way down to 26,000. Here is the part that hasn't happened yet. Right. Yeah. So now what got uncovered early on that we were able to, um, move forward in this process is even though this is a, a, a couple husband and wife, they're in communication. They've been married for many years. They understand each other. But one area that we found was an issue in their living expenses is their, um, their grocery and eating out budget or expense. They're constantly, um, abusing it. Right. But yeah. It started to happen after doing velocity banking, not necessarily before. Before they were cash based when it came to paying for groceries and their um, and eating out. So it was almost like the wife every time she, every time they went to grocery store, she would immediately write down you know what they spent, and then she knows how much money she can spend next week, next week, mm -hmm. and that was their system. It worked. But when we try to quote unquote optimize by running bills through a credit card, they somehow didn't know how to track it. So I said, yeah. oh, it's less painful, you less know, pain oh, and they, she just wasn't writing it down. So I said, look, yeah. what we're going to do is we're going to just kind of target that one area that you're struggling with because everything else is on a consistent basis. So it's, it's much easier for them to know. But when it comes to the inconsistent, consistent bills like food and gas, it's a little confusing for them. So I said, look, we're not going to run the groceries and eating out through the credit card because it, for whatever reason, we're, we're not mindful and we're just all it's of a good. sudden eating steaks every night and, and getting the grouper yep. and, good, and the $40, you know what I mean? So now they're like, okay. What's going to happen is we're, we're running groceries and expenses out of the HELOC because yep. when, you, when you pull money out of your HELOC, you see the balance go up and you see the interest getting charged. So it's a little bit tougher than it is for a credit card. Credit card is zero interest and it's just there, you know, sure yep. the balance goes up, but you're like, you're not even looking at it because you don't really log into your credit card balance, but most people do log into their checking 
account balance and savings yep. and your totally. HELOC, your HELOC is right next to it. So you see it. You're constantly- here I'm going to be a, I'm going to be the Dave Ramsey apologist here. I that's, that's goes right into what the Ramsey camp talks about is yeah, the points and all are great, but people spend more with plastic. And so obviously someone could say, well, Denzel, you're, they're missing out on points and, and you're acknowledging that, but you're just literally saying they spend less. So they literally save a ton because of behavior, yeah. because it's more painful to see checking account interest in real time than not have that pain and spend more. So, you know, if there was no behavior difference, I think both Denzel and I would both agree like, yeah, credit card with points, great. Mm-hmm. But I think that is an interesting and an acknowledgement because most people, probably including you and me, b- behavior is different depending on how we spend. And I think we need to acknowledge that and Absolutely. we need to be fair with that acknowledgement. Absolutely. So especially when people are practicing this, you're going to, you might discover things. You're like, yeah, there's certain areas of velocity where it got real easy to use and manage and it was easy. But, but when it came to the credit card, it just, I didn't, I couldn't make that correlation. And all of a sudden I'm spending more in a certain category of yeah. my living expenses so we were we were able to identify that early and just said look we're just not going to do it because we're talking nearly a thousand dollars difference like they were they were spending almost a thousand dollars more in that one area eating out and groceries oh. where they were initially budgeting for like say four to six hundred bucks but now that's a thousand or over a thousand and i'm like hey you're, you're cutting into the work we just did. Like I just gained $1,400, but now I'm losing it. Right. Yeah. So we were able to nip that in the bud very, very early on. And so if all goes well, which it should, because we're not going to be running that through the, our strategy here that by August balance should be somewhere around just under 27,000. And then the interest kicks back in and you see the difference, right? We were at 127 at eight and a half. It jumps up to 164.50 and Got then it. it'll start going, going down again. Um, so now the question becomes when to start IBC. They're in their fifties. They're still healthy. They have a goal to in, incorporate life insurance, but their primary objective first was, was eliminating debt, becoming debt free. Now the question is, how do we go about doing it on the rest of the debt? Because I, I was informing them, and I think a lot of people in, in my camp that practice velocity banking have a problem with sometimes admitting that, hey, velocity banking is great to give us that head start, but I think yeah. there comes a time where we should shut it off. Like it, it just, yeah. we, we shouldn't use it. Um, or else we're stepping into a world where we're forcing the concept to work. And then we end up getting similar results to the guy that yep. just made extra payments each month yep. where it's like, yeah, we got ahead of him, but he was diligent and he ended up catching up because we're trying to force a HELOC at eight and a half totally. percent to pay off a two or, or five or four yep. percent rate. Uh, even when the math looks right on paper on a spreadsheet. Yeah, for some yeah, it's, reason, it, in I, reality, with you. It, it sometimes doesn't always happen. Totally with you. It can, yep. but sometimes it, it. And it's a great. It's and but for the record, it's still great to have access to that because life happens, and yeah. I would rather have access to money than not. You could make the argument that it could be an emergency fund. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things that you could, you know, roll with. But I'm I'm absolutely with you. There there gets to a point where a lot of people do velocity banking for the quick access to cash, the cash on arbitrage, interest rate, all that. But then. With life insurance, there's so many other benefits that you get that only get better as time goes on. And velocity banking might start off really good. And then 20 years from now, that it diminishes a little bit. Whereas mm-hmm. using life insurance and overfunding it, there's that there's that difference and that reflection point. So I'm just, I, I love where you, how your mind is thinking about this and articulating it. Right. So now, if we have eliminated pretty much all the credit card debt, one car loan, all they have left is a 2.6% mortgage at a payment of just under $1,500. And we have this loan here, right? Another car loan, 45K. Obviously, you know, September, it'll be a little bit less. And then we got the SoFi loan at 55K. Obviously, that'll be a little bit less. 
But these are the balances right now, 8.25, 15.26. You could totally make an argument for doing velocity banking on these two debts with that HELOC even at the 8.5%. And more than likely, the rate would come down a little bit. Um, so you could totally make an argument for continuing velocity banking on these two debts. And then once you get to the mortgage, you stop. Totally. Right? Um, is, and would you I start would... with the SoFi? Would you do SoFi over the other one, even even though the balance is higher, but the interest rate is much let's, higher? Let's see. So 55, 3, 6, 7, 51 divided by 1165. So that's a 47 and a half. And then the 45... Divided by seven. And he's doing a cash flow index for people that yeah. are 59. So according to cash flow index, it says to go after this. The okay. Which, which was according to Caleb's common sense too. So I'm glad that math is validating <laughs> me. It's just like, it would be for sure hit the, the SoFi at 15%. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's a world you did the cash flow index cause you're re reverse engineering to cash flow. And there's a world where the, the lower interest rate might take a greater like cash flow hog. And so you could make the argument if you knock that out, you're freeing up more cash flow, which is better in the long run. But overall, you know, I'm, yeah. So you would knock out the SoFi loan first and yeah. you could easily justify why you did that. Cause you're not, you're not only dealing with interest only loan, but the interest rates cheaper. So you're like, it's Correct. a double whammy, yeah. less cash flow, cheaper interest. Yeah. So that's one route. The, the second is, am I okay with servicing these debts yeah. if, if I have a desire to step into the real estate space and now focus on the top line number, which is increase our income? So when we get to that point, that's where I have an, another conversation with the client where I was like, look, either we stay down this guaranteed path to debt freedom, which is going to give us a guaranteed return on our money, a guaranteed interest savings. Guaranteed cash flow gain, sure, but we do miss out on the opportunity, like what Caleb says, the opportunity cost of being greater, yeah, but the, operating the at a so high fi, level, right? Yeah, but the SoFi look at it as a fifteen percent opportunity. So you're correct. If you could go, if if there's a thirty percent opportunity, go go for it. You would be you'd be on paper not smart putting your resources into a 15% opportunity if you're stepping over 30. But we all know people that are delusional. Yes. We know people that are optimistic when they shouldn't be. And so I think that's what's tricky is like there comes to a point where you just, that, that's why a coach is really important and understanding your investor DNA is important. And being self-aware is important because I know you know people that are doubling 100% by investing in themselves and starting business. Yeah, We also know people that are broke that have taken all their life savings, did an opportunity and it didn't turn out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily make entrepreneurship a scam or real estate a scam, right. but there's cert there's risk there. And so the, the, it, but so if I'm tripping over my words, but if like we were talking about a two and a half percent mortgage, the bar is set so low where it's like, Hey, you could put your money in treasuries and get more than that. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, instead of paying off that debt, let's go, let's go do other things. But 15% would this, would have to be the baseline. But like you said, that's a guaranteed 15%. So I guarantee yeah. you could knock out 15% or go roll the dice in some other areas that the risk versus reward has to be far greater. I'm not, I'm not thinking I'm going to make 17%. I'm not doing that. It would have to be far greater. How do you go about that with your clients to determine whether they jump or whether they knock off the debt? This is where I try to get more data about the individual or the couple in this scenario. Yeah. We're dealing with pastors, husband and wife. We're dealing with godly, godly man, godly woman. They have a desire to serve God. They have a desire to just do ministry for the rest of their living yeah. days. So they don't have this desire to be this visionary CEO, uh, guru, content creator, or in the market or making all this money. If you put them in an environment where they can just literally serve all day long and help people overcome challenges and alcoholism and and all these different things that that people deal with they will be so happy so cool. i think they're going to end up leaning more towards paying off the sofi and then probably paying off the the car loan and then probably even paying off their mortgage because oh, no. they're 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 <laughs> talk to they're, themselves before you pay yeah. off your mortgage right, <laughs> <laughs> right like I, I, i'm not gonna 
have them come on naked numbers have them come on naked numbers before they yeah. pay off the mortgage but I, i'm yeah. with you so far no brainer i think then when we starting to look at the car loan we could we could have a real good conversation pros and cons right but yeah to what's the mortgage rate at the mortgage is at 2.6 percent oh please don't and please don't <laughs> <laughs> so for for them what i what i see based on what they've described about themselves is they would like the idea of having enough real estate investment income to say, replace that working income so that they can finally retire. And then they just, they don't seem like the type that want a 10 X uh, yeah. or a hundred X. Like there's, you know, I kind of measure that in, in people. Yeah. It totally can happen, but for right now, they're, they're more of like, really trying to solve for joy, purpose, God's will, that sort of thing. Yeah. And they know that this money is a big block that they're, you know, Correct. moving. Yeah. So I do think there's a world where we can get guaranteed 16, it's 17 plus hundred dollars yeah. in cash flow, removing the SoFi and the loan. And then yeah. when it's, when they're left to the mortgage, they can, you know, we could probably make a strong argument, you and I together to be like, Hey, um, l l let's, yeah, let's spend time in this real estate. You got this HELOC, you've got, you know, credit card, yeah. you have all this cash flow. Um, now we and who knows, there might be an opportunity that pops in that might not be real estate opportunity. It, it comes back to cash flow. Right. And, you know, I, I am very aligned with how you've laid this out. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so many people that can learn by just how we're having a conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, everyone's different, but. I, yeah, I, I tend to be like their life changes dramatically if they just knock off debt other than their mortgage, like so much cash flow there. And then they can decide, do we pay off your mortgage? Please don't. Do we put the money in the market and get average returns? Do we invest in real estate opportunities or, or maybe the next five to 10 years, there's, there's going to be something that God puts on their heart. And then they're like, hey, this is what I need to do. And the cool thing is you're getting them primed to start looking and thinking. Mm -hmm. But from a cash flow perspective, like it would be really interesting to do like without this versus this or yeah. this versus not having this. And the the cash flow and interest would be like night and day. And it kind of breaks my heart that there's so many people that are just getting crushed and they're not doing anything about it. So, so the last part to this is figuring out when to start IVC. And I'd love to get your thoughts based yeah. on, on I would, when you think there's a world where we can do yeah, both at the let's same Let's go back time. to that. Let's go back to the drawing. Yeah. What, I, what I would do, again, not investment advice, insurance advice, um, just to be clear, I would get a lot more life insurance today, like term insurance that's convertible. Um, okay. I, I think, I think, uh, we do their human life value and we try to get as much life insurance as the insurance companies will l give them at their age, but we get the convertible option. So we give ourselves the value and we might just do a 10 year, might do a 10 or 15 year. Mm -hmm. And then I would knock off the SoFi loan depending on where their mind or heart's at after that's knocked out. Um, probably would, you know, we could have the conversation about the car, but if they don't have, if there's not something that they really want to do, I think I would be totally fine with them doing term insurance as convertible and knocking out both the SoFi and the car loan. Mm -hmm. And then after those are knocked out, then having the conversation about what cash flow going into a, into a policy. Got it. Um, but, but again, yeah, you know, there's benefits to having permanent life insurance. That's that's awesome, but it's a it's a very much like I would be very curious. Like, what other asset are they going to do? Because I have a this is this is my prediction. I don't think retirement is a thing that should be optimized for. I literally think the goal should be for them to do ministry to the day that they die, but to do it on their terms, right. which is kind of ironic because we're talking ministry. But like, do yeah. do minute like work till the day that you die. Mm -hmm. And that's just going to be the reality. They're not going to be able to quote unquote retire. Neither should they want to, but they yeah. should have a place where they can be freedom to choose how they minister and what they do. Mm -hmm. And I would just try to optimize like what assets 
give you guys the ability to better minister. And I and and if the and asset or whole life insurance at, after education, they're like, okay, you're telling me a chronic illness rider, creditor protection, safety. You're telling me this works similarly to like velocity banking, but a little less attractive early on, but maybe more attractive because we're actually earning interest for you know versus a right the best case scenario is zero kind of deal. Mm-hmm. But but I would I would very much be like, how does this serve me in the next 20, 25 years? Right. And this is not going to make me rich. This is going to be like the foundation. And we just have to sit in the reality that you're 50 years old and don't don't have any assets to really show for it other than your your home. And we've been using yeah. that well. You know, and so okay, that, but not too much. Yeah, yeah. So that would be that would just be where I, I would look at how this enhances, but unless they're like Denzel, like we want to do this thing. I would go so far in car because I don't have a confidence in their track record that they'll be able to earn consistent over 8%. Gotcha. And then, but, but maybe that changes, but then after those things are knocked out and we literally have the first world problem of where are we putting our money, mm-hmm. then it's like, a, okay, we could have a conversation about that. Um, but that's kind of, that's kind of my thought process. I don't know if we, this is where we can have a discussion, but yeah, Again, you know them, I don't, and and everyone's in a little bit different scenario, but that's kind of where I would be leaning. Yeah, they're they're adamant on on the debt elimination part, and they're learning about IBC, and I, and so I think, you know, over the next say two years, we can eliminate a lot, um, yeah. and even if there's a running balance on the HELOC, I'm sure that within two years we can get the 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 SoFi. Um, onto the HELOC and then a majority of the, of the car loan onto the HELOC and where you're experiencing that cash flow gain and likely their income goes up. And I like what you said about potentially just getting insured now uh, totally. at their current age because we're only they're underinsured. Older. Right. We're only getting older. They are underinsured yep. according to what they have in terms of debts, um, what they want to be just, able to do. But it also including human life value. Right. They're they're insuring two two and a half years of their ability to earn. Yeah, two you know, so piece. yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So that's that's pretty much everything for for today. And so my my hope that people take away from this is obviously there's those that are watching that you're kind of like a solo lone wolf. You're gonna take this. You're gonna take my rules and how I think, how Caleb thinks. You're gonna create your own thing. You're probably going to run off and do some great things. Uh, but then there's a big portion of you that are uh, maybe not as open to coaching or support, accountability, partnership. And I would really encourage people to be more open to that because even from my perspective, being the person that's holding people accountable, it's yeah. crazy, Caleb, the success difference that people totally. have. No. Yep. It is so cool. I'm like, wait, what did I do? I, all I did was have calls. I'm not it's, in their house. I'm not like no, hawking yeah. over their finances. Hey, hey, hey. But it's like they're checking in, checking in, checking in, checking in. Yeah. Accountability, numbers, sounding numbers. board, just implementate, helping you implement. I mean, this this stuff is, yeah, there, there are certain people that totally get this. But for the most part, I, I do think if you can find somebody – that can hold your hand or at least be in your corner. I think there's massive value. And again, we'll put your link to if this is resonating with you, if you're like, hey, I need this, or I need at least need to like, learn more about this, Denzel's your guy, we'll have the link down below in this video. And also, if you've not subscribed to his channel, by the way, Denzel, we have almost 50% of people that watch our videos don't subscribe to our channel. <laughs> so if you're one of the, if you're one of 50% watching, please subscribe. And we would love to hear from you. Like what case studies do you have next? What do you want to hear next? Um, do you agree or disagree with something that Denzel and I said? Uh, we would love to hear from you. Denzel, any, any final words before we close out? Yes. Please comment below. Please let me know what your, what your thoughts are. If you have any you know rebuttals or what do you want to see next? Caleb and I create, um, because that's literally why we take time out of our day to do this. Uh, We want to serve you abundantly. And we're both big givers. We we love to give, we love to serve. And so I don't, I don't back to the point about having an accountability partner doesn't have to be me, right? If you, if you resonate with me, great. But if you have another person you're watching on the internet or someone in your local area, someone that's 
three, five levels above you, maybe not 25 levels above you, but someone that's like, you know, on a pathway where you can really learn from and, and gather some, some good material around your personal finances, please consider financial coaching, accountability, not necessarily someone to advise, right? Because a financial advisor may just give you an answer. And typically, uh, that's kind of like what we want. We want to be told what to do sometimes when it comes to things that we don't know. But I encourage you to to develop what I call your financial decision-making process. If we can build a template of how we process decisions with your money, bring it through a streamlined process, oh my goodness, and then have accountability with that, oh my goodness, Caleb. I have seen people like really do some awesome things and I got to be a part of it, right? Yeah. And it, it, it's just been phenomenal. So that, that's something that I've been talking more about on my channel. For the past three, four years, I've been a logical guy. And, you know, I've been like an 80% logic, like 20% emotion. But really yeah. the last year or so, attending your event and other events, having my own event, I've been really increasing my emotional intelligence, my, yeah. my spiritual approach to this and noticing how much more impactful that is over the logic. And I'm starting to make that flip of 20% mechanics, 80% psychology. I've been fighting that rule for so many years, that whole 80, 20, 80%, you know, is, is, is uh, psychological and, and 20% is mechanics. I'm like, no, it ain't not over here, my world. <laughs> but now I'm kind of surrendering and saying, okay, all right. You know, got a lot of emotional, uh, trauma going on with my clients and, and these mindset blocks and, and my logical brain is just not doing it. But accountability, emotional intelligence, asking more questions, getting to the root of the issue is way more valuable in achieving financial freedom than actually having millions of dollars in your bank account and not knowing what the heck to do with it or having what, what Daniel talks about, shout out to him, the the scarcity of how to distribute that, right? The, the not having purpose with your money, even when you achieve it, like financial independence or freedom, having all this money and you're actually scared yep. to spend it, right? So that, that's yep. what I would leave you all with. I love it, man. All right, till next time. Thank you. 80% of people that watch our YouTube videos are not subscribed to the channel. So it would mean the world if you've gotten any value from our show or channel to subscribe and, and leave a comment and share your biggest takeaway. It helps other people find our channel.